everybody. We get a lot of questions here, as you may have noticed, about Burns Night and what to wear for Burns Night. However, the larger question is, what is Burns Night all about? Well, Burns Night is the celebration of Robert Burns, known as the Immortal Memory, the National Poet of Scotland. And this holiday basically ranks up there with the other two large holidays in Scottish tradition, that being Hogmanay, New Year's, and St. Andrew's Day. But I would argue that uh, Burns Night is perhaps the most beloved. There are Burns Night celebrations held all around the world. And odds are you can find one in your community. Or if you can't, I think it is really worth considering hosting one of your own. Now, the highlight of any Burns Night, of course, is the address to the haggis. What is the address to the haggis? What is a haggis? What is Burns Night all about? We're going to tackle a little bit of that right now. First of all, Robert Burns. Robert Burns is the national poet of Scotland, very famous for things like writing the song Auld Lang Syne, which is sung at the end of a Burns Supper, and uh, various other works such as To a Mouse, and of course the Address to the Haggis, which we're going to talk about directly. Robert Burns himself is known as the Immortal Memory, uh, sometimes known as the Plowman Poet. He was basically a man of the people who wrote about his life and his experience of living off the land and what it was like to be in a rural Scottish existence. And his words resonate with a lot of honesty, a lot of truth to them, which we still respect today. And really, everything he said gets to the heart of Scottishness, for lack of a better word. So the address to the haggis, of course, is the highlight of the Burns Supper. The Burns Supper is a celebration of Robert Burns' birthday. Robert Burns was born on January 25th, 1759, he died January 21st, 1796. He was only 37 years old. And the first suppers were held by his friends, local guys who knew him, people he drank with, basically, and, and had intellectual discussions with, his, his posse, uh, on the anniversary of his death about five years after it. Now, since then, we've shifted the celebration to his birthday because it's a little bit more optimistic. And Robert Burns was basically a very optimistic guy. He suffered a lot in his life, but his poem... His poetry really brings about a sense of the beauty of life and the important things in life and how to live life to the fullest. The address to the haggis itself was written as almost kind of a joke. Basically, he was going to have a dinner with his friends, and typically you would have a kind of a, a basic mumbled grace before every meal, and his friends were expecting that. They were expecting him to just do the usual, oh, thank you, God, for our meal, blah, blah, blah. But he wrote the address to the haggis instead. The version that he originally did for them, we don't really have. He later refined it and expanded it into the one that we have now, later when he was a, uh, a hot celebrity in Edinburgh and his poet poetry career had gotten off the ground. So what we've done here, what we're going to do now, is break down the address to the haggis so that you can understand what he's talking about and give you a little bit of background information, which will be good for a conversation and just for giving you a more sense of a full experience of your Burns Night. To do that, we've borrowed the services of an associate of ours, Christopher Tate, who is an actor in Edinburgh responsible for the Robert Burns Live Company. Uh, if you've had the opportunity to hear him perform, he is brilliant. He really brings Robert Burns to life, and you can actually hire him even in the States to attend your events. He is basically a world-traveling artist. So, we're going to listen to him and his recitation of the poem, and with each stanza, I'm going to step in and tell you what the translation is and give you a little bit of background information. Fair for your honest sonsy face, great chieftain of the pudden race, aboon them all you tack your place, pange, tribe or therum, weel are you worthy o' grace, as lang's my erum. Okay, so the first stanza, and forgive me, I'm going to use some notes here because I don't have everything memorized. First stanza is basically saying, Greetings and good luck to your honest, cheerful face. Sansi basically means healthy, hearty, cheerful, full of energy. It's the kind of thing you'd uh, address to someone who is looking really good and really just full of vitality. Great chieftain of the boiled meat race of foods. Basically, a pudding... We're not talking about jello here. We're not talking about dessert. 
puddings were a standard form of boiling meat and other ingredients to cook them in a very efficient manner, a very energy efficient manner, from the Middle Ages all the way up through the 19th century. You may have heard of things like Yorkshire pudding, or you may have heard of uh, you know the Christmas puddings that they have in Britain at this time of year. The, the point of a pudding is that you basically are taking all these ingredients and stuffing them into a bag, or in this case, a sheep's stomach, something that's a little bit porous, and you're putting it into a, a boil or a low simmer for a long time. It was a great way to use up leftovers. It's very similar to sausages. And as you know, probably from popular culture, haggis is famous for having had all kinds of things like, like uh, offal in it, organ meats, things like that. And it's one of the ways that people like to say haggis is this, it's this weird Scottish thing. It's, it's kind of gross. Bleh. The truth of the matter is you're basically using up the same kind of leftovers that any culture in Europe did to get the most out of their farm animals. Today, most haggis is actually made out of better quality meats, sometimes rabbit, sometimes lamb, sometimes beef, sometimes pork. It really depends on the individual chef. You can still get haggis that is made with some organ meats in it uh, to give it more of a gamey flavor. But essentially, once all that meat is ground up and mixed in with the other ingredients, you don't notice it so much. I mean, there'll be, there'll be a gaminess to it if it's using you know, the uh, less than prime cuts kind of meat. But what you really taste with a haggis is the spices. That's what it's really all about. So again, puddings were common to Europe. A haggis is a very large and very robust pudding and a very efficient way to get your protein. Remember that in Ayrshire, where Robert Burns grew up, it was a farming community and most people did not have access to meat on a regular basis. They were eating things like potatoes and turnips and kale and occasionally a little bit of meat in there. Oats, of course, basic staple of Scottish cuisine for time and memoriam. So meat was a special occasion and you wanted to take full advantage of it when you had it. So the haggis, as Burns is telling us, is not only a very uh, practical thing, it's also a special treat. It is a special occasion food, it's a feast, and it's the fuel that drives the humble rustic that we're gonna talk about in a moment through his daily chores. You rank above all other dishes coming from the paunch, tripe, offal, etc. Those are all types of puddings. You truly deserve a grace as long as my arm. In other words, I could go on for hours and hours talking about how great you are. I could write a whole sonnet. I could write a whole sermon about how wonderful you are, haggis. The groaning trencher there you fill. Your hurdies like a distant hill. Your pain would help to mend a mill in time o' need, while through your pores the Jews distill, like amber bead. So in this stanza, Burns is basically describing the haggis as it looks before it's cut into, and how great it is as it's presented. He's saying, you fill up the platter and it groans beneath your weight. It's big, it's heavy, it's dense. Your hips swell like a distant hill. In other words, you're very rounded, very full. Interestingly enough, that part is sometimes translated as hips or sometimes translated as buttocks. And it's very likely that Robert was making some saucy kind of randy comments throughout the poem. A skewer on the scale of the one that is holding you together or holding you to the trencher could be used to mend a mill in time of need. Basically, the haggis was on a skewer. It was how you were uh, getting the, the haggis into and out of the pot. And when you put it onto the platter, that basically is how you're lifting it onto the platter. The skewer, again, could be a, a veiled Randy reference to a big, strong skewer. And uh, that would certainly be within Burns's uh, idiom, shall we say. The, uh, the reason he mentions a mill is that in the 18th century, probably the biggest, heftiest, and most complicated piece of machinery that any rustic in Scotland would be familiar with would be a mill, basically a woolen mill or a grain mill big factory type complex there. And the skewer is like, you know, a big beam of wood that you could actually use to fix a big piece of machinery with. It's that strong. So he's exaggerating on purpose. He's basically elevating the haggis and its power. While through your pores, the dews distill to form amber colored beads of moisture. As I was saying before, the bag or the stomach or whatever the casing is for a, pu for a pudding is a bit porous. So as you're serving the haggis, some of the juices, all that, you know, the fats and, and the mixed with a little bit of water and the spices 
is all going to start to bead on the outside and come through. It's, and so you know it's a good haggis. You know it's a really good pudding because you've got these amber beads of pure you know, broth, basically, and just, you know, deliciousness is coming out of it, seeping of it. Imagine kind of like um, the uh, the beads of moisture on the outside of a well-roasted Thanksgiving turkey, you know, for a visual. It's kind of like that. It's the juices of the meat and all those spices. His knife, see rustic labor dicht, and cut you up with ready slicht, trenching your gushing entrails bricht like ony ditch, and then... Oh, what a glorious sight! Warm reeking, rich. Okay, so now we're actually getting into cutting up the haggis itself. It's time to eat, and the star of our show is the farmer, the rustic, the laborer, the working man, the Scottish man of the land. So, the translation roughly is: Watch as the rustic laborer wipes his knife and cuts the haggis up with easy skill digging a great trench right through the middle of it. It's like a ditch, basically another farm reference. And then once it's opened up, it's a glorious sight. The part of the haggis you eat has now opened and spilling forth. The steam is rising and of course, steaming and warm with good rich smells. Reekin in modern parlance, when you say something, oh, something reeks, you usually mean it in a derogatory way, but in the Scots, it just means it's a very strong smell. It could be good, it could be bad. In this case, it is delicious. It is that first cut in and woof, the steam comes out and the room is filled with this wonderful, wonderful aroma of all those spices and that meat. Then horn for horn they stretch and strive, deal tuck the hindmost on they drive, till all their wheels swelled kites belive are bent. Like drums, then old good man, miss like to arrive. But thank it hums. The people gathered for the meal are demolishing this haggis. They're taking horn spoons, horn being a common medium for making utensils back in the day, it was very easy to work with, and they're digging in. And they're digging in so hard that they are competing with, with each other. They're racing to get into the haggis. Devil take the hindmost is a common expression now, partially due to Burns' use of it, basically saying the last in line, the guy who's unlucky and is losing out at the end. They're digging in and racing to get into the haggis and scarf up as much as they can because it's so delicious and because they're very hungry, I suppose. They get through the meal and finally their bellies are swollen like drums. They've eaten and eaten and eaten. <sighs> they're incredibly full and satisfied. The haggis is filling and delicious and fills them up. And of course, this is where you'll have the narrator often doing the fake belch in the, in the narration uh, to drive that point home. And finally, the master of the house, who is most likely the one who's eaten the most, finally says, God be thank it. He's basically doing what you would normally do after you've eaten the meat course of a meal and praising God for the gift of the food. Common practice with any meal back then. Is there that our is French ragout, or oleo that would stow a sow, or fricassee would mark or spew a perfect scunner? Looks doon, oh, no, merci. We sneering, scorn for you, on sick of dinner. <laughs> All right, so now in this verse, we get into the more nationalistic and uh, chest thumping part of the poem, where he disparages people who don't eat haggis and rather prefer foreign cuisine. This could be foreigners, people who are not Scottish. It could also refer to people of the upper classes. And the verse essentially is saying, is it possible for anyone over his French ragu or his olio, Italian food, stew that would bloat even a sow? He's saying that those foods could make a, a pig sick. Uh, or his fricassee, which would make the sow vomit, Nice image there, right? In total disgust, how could they possibly look down and sneer in a scoreful way over a dinner like a haggis? In other words, who are they to talk, eating these fancy rich French foods and these Italian foods and all these foreign foods that was fashionable and it was something you had access to if you were in the upper classes. But the implication is that this is inferior food and that these are basically corrupt people for 
deigning to use these foods as opposed to their native born cuisine. Per devil, seeing ower his trash, as feckless as a withered rash, his spindle shank, a good whip lash, his neave a knit, through bloody flood or field to dash, oh how unfoot. And this continues in this verse now, where he's basically decrying how sad it is that these people are not appreciating their rustic roots. Poor devils, look at them eating trashy fare. He actually calls the foreign food trash. They're feeble. He's as feeble as a withered reed. His skinny leg, thin as the end of a whip. That's pretty thin. His dainty fist is small as a hazelnut. And he is unfit to play at any dashing part in battles on sea or on the land. So now he's getting the fighting aspect into it. Basically, these people with their foreign cuisines and their polite manners and their effete nature are basically physically unfit. They're weaklings, as opposed to the rustic. But mark the rustic haggis fed. The trembling earth resounds his trade. Clap in his wally neave a blade, he'll mack it whistle. Our legs and arms and heads will sned like taps of thristle. So we had the effete lovers of foreign cuisine, the higher classes who are not as pure of heart, perhaps, as the rustics. Now we talk about how great the rustics are. Consider the haggis-fed man from the country. The very earth trembles beneath his heavy tread. He's strong. You put a blade in his mighty fist and he'll make it whistle. He's going to use it so well in a fight. Shearing off opponents' legs and arms and heads as easily as if he were cutting off thistle tops. So he's comparing the labor of the farmer to combat, and he's saying that thanks to Haggis and thanks to all this strong rustic living, this guy is basically a Scottish superhero. True. Ye powers, wa mak mankind your care, and dish the moot their billow fair. Old Scotland wants nae skink and wear that jobs and luggies. But if you wish her grateful prayer, gee her a haggis. And now we get to the final verse, the coup de gras. You powers who look after mankind, basically divinity, and distribute food among them, old Scotland wants no watery dishes that splash around in their bowls, now this saucy stuff. If you want Scotland's grateful prayer, give Scotland a haggis. Essentially, again, the rustic power of the food builds strong men and women, builds a strong people, and makes Scotland a great place. That's basically it. As a man of the people, Burns was a big fan of uh, lauding the humble roots of his fellows. And... Uh, is almost sardonic. The haggis address is very definitely meant to be a bit tongue-in-cheek. It is uh, irreverent in some ways, uh, but it's got a lot of strength to it, and the humor is a huge part of that. And this is why when you attend a burn supper, you'll probably find that whoever's giving the address is going to be a bit flamboyant, a bit over the top, a bit, uh, you know, goofy with it, and uh, they'll engage in all the pantomime at various parts of the poem, A to get that humor across, and B, nowadays, to help anyone who may not understand the Scots, to get a good sense of what's going on. So when you see them perform the address, they'll be miming parts like, long is my arm, for the long grace that the haggis would deserve, cutting into the haggis, usually with a skin do, sometimes with a dirk, and sometimes even taking jabs at people around them. When they talk about the uh, effete foreigner or the effete noble, they'll find somebody in the audience who is skinny looking or scrawny looking and kind of make fun of their body shape. And when they talk about the healthy rustic, they'll find somebody in the audience who is big and burly looking and they'll shake them by the shoulders and demonstrate how strong they are thanks to their haggis eating and basically play it up. In the old times, when they did the address, you would even start with everybody standing with one foot on a chair and one foot on the table and drinking whiskey as the haggis was processed into the hall. And then they would take the whiskey glasses and throw them over their shoulders so they'd shatter on the floor behind them. Chances are you're not going to find that happening at your local burn supper. 
Point being, a burn supper is supposed to be a little bit rowdy, a little bit raucous. It's all about sharing good company and good cheer and being proud of being Scottish. And not just of being Scottish, but of being a person who knows what's important in life and is prepared to live life to the fullest, just as the immortal memory did. So whatever you're planning on doing for your Burns Night, I hope you can keep that in mind, and I hope you have a fantastic time. And as always, raise a glass to the immortal memory. Sláinte bá. Fair for your honest sonsy face, great chieftain of the pudden race, aboon them all you tak your place, pange tribe or therum, weel are you worthy o' grace, as lang's my erum. The groaning trencher there you fill, your hurdies like a distant hill, your pin would help to mend a mill in time o' need, while through your pores the dews distill, like amber bead. His knife, see rustic labour dicht, and cut you up with ready slicht, trenching your gushing entrails bricht like ony ditch. And then, oh, what a glorious sicht, warm reeking, rich. Then horn for horn they stretch and strive, deal tuck the hindmost on they drive, till all their wheel swelled kites belive are bent. Like drums, then old good man, mist like to rive, <laughs> but think it hums. Is there that our is French ragout, or oleo that would stow a sow, or fricassee with mark of spew, a perfect scunner, looks doon, oh, no, merci, we sneering, scorn for view, on sick of the <laughs> Pair devil, see him o'er his trash, as feckless as a withered rash, his spindle shank, a good whip lash, his neave a knit, through bloody flood or field to dash, oh how unfoot! But mark the rustic haggis fed, the trembling earth resounds his tread, clap in his wally neave a blade, he'll mack it whistle, and legs and arms and heads will sned, like Taps of thristle. Ye powers, wha mak mankind your care, and dish them out their billow fair, old Scotland wants nae skink and wear that jobs in luggies. But if ye wish her grateful prayer, gie her a haggis.